Welcome to Monday's edition of Cross Question. I'm Ian Dale. If you'd like to ask our panel a question, I'll tell you who they are in a moment. The number to call is 0345 6060 973. You can, of course, watch us on Global Player as well. Uh, joining me tonight, as if by magic, it's Sir David Lindyton. He's now the chairman of the Royal United Services Institute. Couldn't have picked a better night for him to be on. Also former Deputy Prime Minister and former Conservative MP. Dr Dan Poulter is Conservative MP for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich and Vice Chair of the APPG on Coronavirus. Ellie May O'Hagan is the Director of the Class Think Tank and Alex Thomas is Programme Director at the Institute for Government. He's also a former senior civil servant who spent 17 years working in the Cabinet Office and the Department of Health, including whisper it, working closely with Sue Gray. He might be able to give us a few insights into what she's likely to come up with or, or not. <laughs> 0345 6060 973. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850 cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. It's a very, very busy news day, as you've no doubt seen. Uh, let's go to our first question. It's Simon in Orpington. Simon, what would you like to ask? Uh, evening, uh, Ian, and evening panel. In light of being too Muslim, in light of resignation today in the House of, uh, in the House of Lords, which has never, ever been done before, and um, more parties coming out, how long has Big Dog got left in power? <laughs> I love that question. Um, it should explain, you're referring to Lord Agnew, who resigned as a Cabinet Office and Treasury Minister today, um, at the dispatch box in the House of Lords. As you say, I don't think that's ever happened before. It was a full-on flounce as well. When he finished, he, he put his papers together um, just and just said goodbye and then flounced out of the chamber. Never seen anything like it before. Um, David Ledington, I've got to come to you first on, on this. I mean, um, I, I mean the, the, the sort of snap answer is to say it, it's up to, in the short term, Conservative MPs, and then if he's still the Prime Minister at the next election, then up to the electorate. Um, I think that, you know, in the very unlikely event that he was to, you know, ring me up or invite me into number 10 to, to offer advice, um, I would be, be saying probably three things. I mean, first to... Um, be transparent, be completely open. And that includes if things have been, if bad mistakes have been made, um, no point in hiding them. It will seep out. You know, people will get messages out to, to journalists about what is supposed to have gone on. So be open about it. And I think he'd been open about this from the start. He'd be in a better place now. Secondly, if things have gone wrong on his watch within number 10, apologise, um, take responsibility, Yes, then set the house in order, change appointments if you want to, but don't try and dump all the blame on um, officials and junior advisors and so on. People in charge of an organisation have to take responsibility, whether in the public or the private sector. And third um, is um, to get on not just you know, talking about the major policy initiatives, but actually have good quality operational plans to get them delivering results. I mean, there are things, you know, despite my disagreements with the Prime Minister on, on Europe, most obviously, what he's saying about levelling up, what he's saying about zero carbon, I applaud. Um, but what I haven't seen yet are the detailed plans about how you turn an ambition or a policy statement into practical action where, where people see the beneficial results in their communities and in their everyday lives. And, 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 and that focus, including the focus on detail, is what needs to happen. Frank, frankly, whether it's it's Boris Johnson who's still in charge or somebody else, you know, is, is brought in uh, to replace him. Um, so, so, so that it seems to me, in the interest of the country, is what the prime minister has to do. Uh, and what do you make of the latest revelations today about this uh, birthday party? Because for the first time, they've admitted that there was a gathering. It's clear that it was illegal in the circumstances. Um, this seems to be an open and shut case of the Prime Minister ignoring I mean, his own laws. I mean, you know, obviously, I, I've seen the same news reports as you have. Um, and I am, you know, the number of years I spent in Parliament, I'm, I'm always reluctant to leap to judgment on the basis of press reports only. But yeah, the, the time we're talking about, there was no such thing as a, a work social event that, that was somehow legal when all other types of social events were illegal. 
And if things took place then that uh, were unlawful, then you know, they need to be open about what went on, why, you know, whose error was it to organise such an event. And trying to cover or to, to use words to suggest that something was, was not unlawful if actually it was in breach of the rules that everybody else was, was being told to comply with and being fined if they didn't comply with them well then you have to take responsibility for it i mean at the end of the day you know it, it, it's it's for you know current conservative members of parliament my, my successor and others in, in in the first place to decide whether um you know boris johnson is able to recover um uh, and and actually govern with the authority that's needed i think it was going to be a very difficult year in 2022 in terms of cost of living inflation rates international instability and so on, um, or whether they need to look elsewhere. And I, I, as an ex-MP, I, I, I don't want to sort of be giving lectures to current serving MPs about... No, but, what but you, you, you are an instinctive loyalist, um, David. Um, the, key uh, and the key thing is the country, and it is in the interest of the country that you have a prime minister and a cabinet who have the authority... Um, you know, despite a lot of the country will disagree with what they do, that's true of any PM, they have the authority to carry through policies that they believe are in the national interest. But that's the problem at the moment. A lot of people it think is. that that authority is disappearing. Authority um, is weakened very gravely by, by what has happened and what has been reported in the last few weeks. And if you were an MP now, would you be putting in a letter? As I, as I said, Ian, I'm not, I'm not in the business of giving lectures to my successors and others about what they, what they should do. Um, you know, they will have to weigh up very carefully you know, where the national interest lies in this. Well, let's go to a sitting MP who does have to make that decision, Dan Poulter. Um, ha have you made a decision on, the, on that? Do you have confidence in the Prime Minister still? Well, look, I mean, Ian, as, as you will, I'm sure, be aware, I've been working on the front line of the pandemic um, throughout as an NHS doctor. So I have been uh, particularly uh, distressed having seen people die of COVID um, who otherwise would be here today and having done my very best, as of my NHS colleagues and many other people to follow the rules. I, you know, I instinctively do not like the uh, appearance and, and we have a uh, you know, perhaps beyond appearance, but, but emerging facts and omissions that the rules were not followed by the very same people who were making them. And that's clearly uh, unacceptable. I, you know, I, I agree very much with what David has said, but there are three things I think we can, I, I would certainly say uh, clearly this evening, that if um, the Prime Minister um, has actively misled Parliament, or if he is found to have been uh, um, in where well, he faces criminal sanction, or if he has actively um, um, participated and knowingly participated uh, in uh, an act in breach of those very same rules, I find it very difficult to see uh, in these circumstances uh, how he um, could um, continue in position. Um, and uh, I think he would be uh, find that his tenure as prime minister would be untenable, and I would be very sure um, that uh, even if um, the report is published and the uh, facts are ambiguous um, as to that or that the Prime Minister made an attempt to massage the report in how it was presented, I'd be very sure that at that point um, there would be enough uh, letters triggered to promote a leadership uh, ballot or a vote of confidence in the Prime Minister. Do you, do you think that's the moment that the so-called men and women in grey suits pay a little visit and say, look, don't prolong this any longer. Do, do it for your country, do it for your party, just resign? Well, I mean, that, I would, would hope that would be the case, but also I would hope that somebody who holds very high office, and if they want to maintain the integrity of that very high office, that they would um, look, up, look it upon themselves as being the, the right thing to do, and it wouldn't come to that. But... You know, the, we, we, we shall see. But I would uh, imagine that uh, the weight of the parliamentary party opinion would be, uh, would, would if that were to be the case, and those uh, circumstances I just outlined were to come to pass, and then I would imagine that the parliamentary party would, uh, would, would act.
So to answer Simon in Orpington's question, I mean, I'm not even sure it's possible to answer. He says, how long has the big dog got? I mean, judging from what you've just said, probably not very long. Well, the, the difficulty, I suppose, is with the, with the Sue Gray uh, report and, and uh, others on, on this panel uh, this evening know her better um, than, uh, the, the, than others of us. But the difficulty of the report is that there appears to be um, emerging uh, evidence um, that she needs to investigate and in emerging parties almost by the, the day. So actually getting to the point that the report is published is the first thing we need to come to. Um, I hope that, that, can, that, the, you know, that she has a team around her who can make sure that you know, this emerging evidence that's come forward this evening, the ITV um, I believe that they have, um, can be examined and looked at uh, and that we can have that report this week because it's in no one's interest for this, this matter to drag on um, and uh, it's important that the Prime Minister um, does come to Parliament when that report is published uh, and make clear um, how he is going to um, proceed um, or whether he feels he can proceed if indeed um, the findings um, are, as, uh, are as challenging as we um, suspect that they okay. may be. Ali Mayo Hagen, what's your view? My view on the birthday party or on how long well, he's on, got? Well, on, on, Simon, on Simon's question. Well, um, first of all, can I just say, uh, one of the reasons I love coming on this show is your callers, who are always great, um, and that was a great question. Um, I think that um, it, he might last longer than we think. You know, I think it, we need to remember that Theresa May survived a vote of no confidence and clung on for a while. And I think um, there isn't, well, I mean, I, I defer to the two conservatives on the panel about sort of internal conservative politics but my understanding is that there isn't necessarily unity in the conservative party over who should replace boris johnson and that leads me to wonder whether he will actually stay on for longer than any of us think because when there isn't an obvious successor that everybody can get behind people are reluctant to get rid of what is already there so i wonder whether that's going to happen and you know i think the problem with that is, so at class we do lots of research where we talk to people about their views on a wide number of issues. And what we found just very unequivocally, and your callers I'm sure will say the same thing, that people are very disillusioned about politics. They've lost the ability to believe that change, good change is possible and they're very cynical about the people in charge. So my worry is that if Boris Johnson doesn't go and doesn't go soon, and that will just really entrench the cynicism that people have in politics and in the ability of government to represent the people properly and fairly. And I think that is bad for democracy and that is bad for all of us. And I also think it's not true. It's not true that people can't make a difference to politics. Um, it's not true that you can't affect politics. But I feel that when things something like something like this happens and no one is held properly to account, it encourages this idea in people that everything's rubbish and there's nothing they can do about it, which I think is really terrible for democracy. So that's why I hope that he does step down soon. But whether that will happen, I think, is a different matter. Um, Alex Thomas from the Institute for Government. Um, would you like to be in Sue Gray's shoes tonight? No. Um, <laughs> that's, that's an easy one, Ian. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I mean, not, not least because... It is extraordinary the weight that is being loaded on this one civil servant and this one uh, uh, report from a civil servant. I mean, it's sometimes talked about as if this is an inquiry, and it's not an inquiry, it's a fact-finding investigation. Uh, and it's really important, as others have said, to remember that the decision about the future of Conservative Party leader and, and the Prime Minister is on Conservative uh, MPs. I thought Dan there was admirably clear about the criteria that he'd used to uh, work out um, whether uh, the Prime Minister still had his confidence or not. Um, I mean, to uh, you know, you, you said at the start I could uh, shine some lights on the uh, the woman on everybody's uh, lips. I mean, she's a she's a civil servant. She's not always um, uh, you know a, a you know she hasn't had a particularly conventional career. She stayed in the same job on propriety and ethics for a long time before going off to uh, to, to work in Northern Ireland and then and then coming back more more recently. Um, uh, she's you know indefatigable. She's um, uh, in it hardworking. Uh, she uh, is very emotionally intelligent and. And understands the cabinet office in Whitehall better than almost any other um, official that I've ever worked with. But she is a civil servant. She's not there to 
to stand in judgment over the prime minister so no but she, she's also somebody you can't pull the wool over over sue gray's eyes in my in my limited experience of uh, my encounters not that i not that i tried i hasten to add <laughs> but <laughs> but um she she doesn't suffer fools gladly she she is not somebody who i think is going to produce some sort of whitewash which i think a lot of i mean the liberal democrats have just issued a press release saying that this inquiry is not fit for purpose well i don't they think the metropolitan police should be taking it over now well until we've actually seen it i think it's a bit presumptuous of them to say that yeah, and it depends what the purpose is. I mean, the purpose of this is to establish some facts. Uh, you look at the terms of reference, they're quite limited, but they do allow um, her to look at whether guidance was broken and to establish the facts. Um, uh, I think that's you know that that's reasonable. It's also very reasonable for her to look into civil service conduct, which you know may or may not become a, uh, mm. a an issue after the um, after we see the the report. Um, but what uh, what I don't think MPs can do is outsource their judgment about about who should be uh, the leader of their party to to, to one civil servant. Um. Kenton, Ken in Kidderminster says, You described Lord Agnew as flouncing out of the chamber. I think not. He spoke with dignity and in the same mode left the chamber. Your description is incorrect. Well, I, I've actually seen the video of that. And as somebody who was accused of flouncing out of the Good Morning Britain studio once, I, I've got an interest in the use of that word where I thought I walked rather calmly out of that studio. But he, shall we say he walked briskly out of the, out of the chamber? Ken, I don't want to fall out about it. Uh, thank you for your question, Simon. We'll come to more questions in a moment. 0345 606. 21 minutes past eight. Uh, Dan Poulter, David Liddington, Ellie May O'Hagan and Alex Thomas with us answering your questions. Um, slightly related to the last question, it's Mohammed in South Shields. Hello, Mohammed. Hi, Ian. My question is to the panel, please. When Boris does go, he's going to go very shortly. Who would you like to see in his place? Who would you like to see replace Boris Johnson? Um, and let, let's try and avoid... Well, it's not my place to advise the Conservative Party on who their leaders should be. This is the question that Mohammed wants you all to answer. Ellie May, let's come to you. Um, from, from somebody who's broadly on the left, who, do, who would you fear as a next Conservative leader and who would you actually like to see as a Conservative leader? Who would I like to see? I've never thought of that question before. Um, <laughs> Who would I fear? I think that Rishi Sunak is the biggest threat to the Labour Party, I would say. He's the most popular um, in the Red Wall. I think that you would see fewer. So just to uh, explain for your uh, listeners who aren't as nerdy about politics as I am, um, many of the marginal seats in this country are actually marginal between the Conservatives and the Lib Dems. And actually, the Conservatives have lost two by-elections recently um, that have gone to the Lib Dems. And I think you'd see less of that if Rishi Sunak was a uh, leader of the Conservative Party. I think that the Conservatives would hang on to those seats and they might still hang on to their red wall seats as well. Um, and I also think that Rishi Sunak... Uh, he's distancing himself from the national insurance rise, which is very unpopular for good reason, I would say. He, um, he's the Chancellor. And, how can he distance himself? Well, I completely agree with you. You know, how can he? It was his policy, but he's now calling it the Prime Minister's tax. Which, So I, th I am guessing that if and when he runs for leader, he will cancel it. He will sort of denounce it and say he's not going to do that anymore. And I think he'll also say that he was the one who initiated the furlough scheme, which I can tell you as someone who runs a trade union think tank that it was trade unions that negotiated that scheme um, with the Treasury. So, um, but I'm sure that's what he will say. Um, and I think... You know, all I, of that I should, I should tell you that our listeners know that because Francis O'Grady spent an hour with me on Thursday telling me. Oh, really? Great, <laughs> great. Um, love Francis. Um, yeah, so I think... Um, I think that if he uh, becomes leader, I think, well, you know, it's a long time until the next election. I mean, so, you know, like in, in 2019, after the last election, would we ever dream that we would have been legally shut away in our homes for the next three months? You know, so anything can happen between now and 2024. Mm, okay. But I do consider so, Rishi Sunak the biggest threat to the Labour Party. Uh, Dan Poulter. 
Um, so if, if, if Boris were to be, um, so we say, run over by a Boris bike or, or, uh, or uh, overcome by an avalanche of letters, perhaps more appropriately to the, to the uh, 1922 committee uh, chair, uh, uh, Sir Graham Brady, um, I, I, I think there are a number of potential contenders um, who, who will um, emerge. Um, probably um, amongst those, I, I, would, I, think I tend to agree um, with um, uh, you know, the, uh, Ellie May's um, position, I, I think Rishi, Rishi Sunak has many merits, um, and um, but I, I, what I would like is somebody who's going to be um, you know, a pragmatist and get on with the job of delivering uh, sound government. And uh, you know, it's important that when you um, you know the government uh, you know is, is not just by sound bites and. Uh, but it's actually about uh, proper delivery of policies that improve people's lives. Um, and uh, I would suggest um, that probably of the main contenders who are likely to emerge, I think Rishi Sunak probably would be the one who's most likely to do um, a good job you, in that you, respect. You don't, think it w- you don't think it would need to be somebody who hasn't sort of been around for the last two years, sort of Jeremy Hunt, Tom Tugendhat, somebody like that? Well, I think you know, a, a number of um, people have a merit. I, I think one of the difficulties, actually, at the moment, and, and I, I was speaking frankly, is um, that uh, some people who, um, who would, I, I think Boris Boris uh, would have done well to have had in government and not in government at the moment, um, and people who would have made uh, very good uh, cabinet ministers or uh, senior ministers are not in 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 those posts. And I and I I, I think I think that you know. Yes, I can see the argument that having somebody um, who hasn't been uh, part of the uh, current cabinet um, would potentially come with a, a clean pair of hands, if you if, if you like. Um, but uh, that all said and done, um, you know, having looked at the you know, who I see as the likely uh, people to emerge, I I I would say that you know, if Forrest were to be uh, uh, you know to no longer to be prime minister, then. Probably for me, Rishi Sunak is is the okay. logical, pragmatic choice who who would who would be, I think, unifying most most unifying for the country, um, uh, you know, uh, and that's uh, and I think would do a good job of actually delivering uh, policies that are going to uh, uh, make a difference to people and, and uh, make their lives better and easier. Alex Thomas. Uh, thanks, Ian. I have to say, as a as a former civil servant uh, working for an impartial think tank, answering this question <laughs> on live radio, absolutely well, going to test you, isn't it? So, so, so uh, thank you for that. The um, uh, and uh, but despite your your warning earlier, I am going to slightly sidestep it and say, uh, 2022, 2023 are going to be really difficult years. Um, inflation and cost of living. Uh, There are going to be some really potentially very destabilising elections in uh, Northern Ireland coming up in uh, May. Um, uh, The pandemic isn't going to go away. Um, There are some really, really difficult things for whoever leads the country to tackle. So uh, uh, whoever it is, they will need to be equipped with enormous reserves of stamina uh, and focus and, uh, and ability to kind of get things done. So I'm very sorry to sidestep, however tempting it is. You are wasted at the Institute for Government. You should be in politics with that answer. Um, David Liddington. Yes, it's true. Alex was a, a high-flying civil servant. He was certainly in politics, although not party politics. <laughs> <laughs> Very effectively. Um, the, I, I, mean, I, I would, of course, get a vote along with other Conservative Party members from whichever two names Dan and parliamentary colleagues send to us. I think what I will be looking for it, it are, are three things. Um, first of all, competence and the authority that derives from being competent and on, on top of the case and with the ability to delegate, because you can't do everything yourself, um, but then to follow up and hold people accountable for how they implement policy for you. Um, and I think you know, Boris, Johnson, Boris Johnson's strengths include being one of the great political showmen. I and mean, he's in, in the sort of Heseltine tradition. He likes to present himself as, 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 a, as he says, a Brexity Hezer. Um, and I think that whenever he goes, whether that's sooner or later, there will be an appetite in the country for something a bit different, for somebody who is perhaps, you know, less glamorous. Um, uh, you, know, you mean like more- Keir Starmer? 
I think, well, I, I, I think Clem Attlee was actually the Prime Minister that I, I, I had in my mind at that time, or John Major after Margaret Thatcher. And I think one of the risks of the party is that Keir, um, I think, you know, will pitch to that uh, uh, that outlook on, on, on the part of the electorate. So I think the Conservative Party, if, if, because if the Conservative Party isn't able to demonstrate competence between now and a 2024 election, then after 14 years in office by then, I think it, it will have a very big struggle at that general election. Secondly, and it was um, one that Alex made, um, I, I want to see a, a, a new leader, whenever that leader and prime minister comes, who cares passionately about the union of the United Kingdom, but it, who, who doesn't just care passionately about it, but is going to be effective in bringing the different parts of the UK together. And that means respecting devolution and uh, being able to build working relationships with devolved leaders even if they're from different political parties to yours. And actually, one of the things that Rishi Sunak does have in his favour is that if you look at opinion polling in Scotland, he is streets ahead of any other member of the, the current cabinet and Conservative Party leadership in terms of how he is regarded by Scottish voters. And so that would certainly count in his favour. And then the third thing I, I would be looking for is somebody who would bring the, the party together um, someone who, who, from my perspective, I, I would term, you know, from the the One Nation tradition of the Conservative Party, or, or who is at least capable of appealing to the One Nation wing of the party. I detest the polarisation of politics that we're seeing in this country. It's not as, anything like as bad as they have in the United States at the moment. Um, but I, I think we need to try and shift away from that. That, in my experience of politics, is not how ordinary voters live their lives. In practice, the idea that you can't be friends with um, somebody from a different political party or even from a different um, camp within your own party is just madness. Um, you know, how many doors have Dan and I and probably Ellie May knocked on where you've You've had the response from one half of a couple who says, well, I'm with you, but I'm afraid the wife or the husband's with the other lot. Uh, they've been happily married for 20, 25 years, voting to cancel each other's votes out at every election that comes. And they, they don't be happy doing that. And other people who never discuss politics in the family because it's not that big an issue for them. And I think I want to see uh, the new prime minister, when he or she comes, as somebody who can bring the party back together again uh, and who and in doing that bring a sense of unity and common purpose to the country because I think we do need a healer. Okay, well, some interesting answers there. One, one or two more clearer than others, it has to be said, but uh, pays your money, you take your choice. It's uh, 8.32 on LBC. Helen Hodden. On LBC, call 0345 6060 8.36, let me reintroduce my panel to you. Ellie May O'Hagan is Director of the Class Think Tank. Alex Thomas is Programme Director of the Institute for Government. Sir David Liddington is Chair of RISI, the Royal United Services Institute, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister. And Dr Dan Poulter is Conservative MP for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich. Right, let's go on to an entirely different subject now. A text from Rebecca in Reading. Are we set for war with Russia? Are we taking it seriously enough? Alex Thomas. Well, it's some, uh, it, it, it links in part to our previous subject, which is a government that is, uh, you know, distracted by uh, scandal, uh, is not uh, giving its full attention to some of uh, these sort of extraordinary um, uh, events that are happening across uh, Europe. So, I mean, I certainly feel every time, you know, you get caught up in the web of what's going on in Westminster and every time Ukraine sort of intrudes on your consciousness, you think, you know, blimey, this is, you know, there's, there's something extraordinary uh, happening. I think it's also interesting how the different parts of the British government are responding. I mean, the Ministry of Defence is getting pretty good notices um, at the moment for um, uh, you know being on the front foot uh, and uh, leading uh, a more sort of interventionist stance in terms of uh, 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 coordinating uh, weapons uh, supplies to, to Ukraine and uh, and so on. Um, uh, the Foreign Office uh, and, and there's been some criticism of the Foreign Office that it's sort of taken a while to catch up diplomatically, and then we know that. The 
the, the Prime Minister, I'm sure, is spending time on this, but um, has lots of other things to um, juggle. So it's you know, it is it's a, obviously an extraordinarily important thing. My my sense is that there is there are some really really big decisions being taken at the moment. Whether it was the one to, the decision to release some um, uh, British and American intelligence on Saturday night about Russian um, uh, uh, pl- supposed plans to install uh, uh, leaders in uh, Ukraine um, or to send those um, arms supplies uh, and both uh, I mean uh, in your program an honorable exception but um, uh, not getting quite as much uh, attention either from the media or from the broader political and government class uh, as it might um, so uh, why do you think that is? I think it's it's partly the you know the ongoing uh, uh, scandals around the parties are so sort of compelling. There's a there's a soap opera uh, narrative um, uh, to it. Um, I, I think it's um, I mean I think it is probably um, most mostly that. Um, I, I don't think it's a sort of Ukraine far away country of which we know nef- know nothing. I think that there is a sense that this is you know a really uh, important um, significant uh, moment. Um, uh, but I, I suppose all that will change uh, you know if the situation deteriorates uh, in, in in Ukraine. Um, but it, you know definitely this, this is a you know potentially a very uh, very major moment. Now, David Lindington, you were a Foreign Office Minister, Minister for Europe. Um, I don't know how much you know about Ukraine, if you ever went there or met met people, met your counterparts from there. Um, But Alex just said, well, he's not sure this this really falls under the category of a faraway country of which we know nothing. Certainly seems to be Joe Biden, doesn't it? I think that that the, the Western leaders, for the most part, are now taking... The crisis more seriously though like you and like alex i have been dismayed at how little attention this has had in media and in parliament uh, until very recently um particularly if you compare it say with the um the, the the degree of attention there was to the decisions about syria um being taken in parliament in both 2013 and then again in, in 2015 um but it, this is very important I, yeah i went i had responsibility for relations with ukraine i went there four or five times as a minister, met Ukrainian ministers and officials in London and in Brussels as as well. And when you go to Ukraine, when you talk to people, you go to universities, you go to um, chat to people at local level, um, you find people who feel every bit as European and wanting want the same things as, as people in other European democracies, Britain, Germany, you know, Norway, Sweden, Poland. Um, they want decent life themselves and their families. They want to have freedom of a speech, a speech, association, assembly. They want to decide for themselves who should govern them, not have another country dictate to them. And the problem is at the moment is that for Mr. Putin, the very idea of a Ukraine that is sovereign and independent he is deeply uncomfortable with. He has said publicly he regards the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest catastrophe in international relations in his lifetime. He yearns, I think, to get the empire back. Um, But deeper than that, I think he believes probably accurately that a successful, stable, democratic, prosperous Ukraine would, by virtue of its example, Um, cause a massive challenge for the Kremlin and for Putin's regime in Russia, because it would be the country next door to Russia with whom Russia feels a particular affinity and historical links, um, doing something different and succeeding. And so I think Putin wants to keep Ukraine um, either weak and divided or uh, uh, at the most extreme level subservient and in, in practice um, uh, subjugated to, to Russia, a genuine vassal state. Um, I hope that deterrence works and we don't see military conflict. The omens at the moment are not good. There are something like 100,000 Russian troops. They are stationed in different places around the borders of Ukraine, uh, including in Belarus to the, the north of Ukraine. There are Russian naval vessels that are en route from the Baltic fleet with reports they may possibly be heading for the Black Sea to threaten Ukraine from the south. We don't know that, so I don't know that for certain. Um, and you can't keep that number of troops sort of sitting, waiting, alert, on standby 
forever. You know, you, at some stage you have either to to take them back and and, and calm down, or you have to, or you take action. And and my fear is that Putin would regard the loss of face of stepping back as something he was not prepared to tolerate, and therefore he will go for military action of a greater or lesser scale. Okay. Uh, the answer, we won't go to war is the answer to Rebecca's question, because Ukraine is not in NATO, so Britain, France, United States don't have a, 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 a duty to defend Ukraine. But we have to make sure Russia pays if she does intervene with a really powerful package of diplomatic and economic measures and be prepared for um, you know, something pretty much like a Cold War with Russia for a while, and also to reinforce military and, 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 NATO and, allies. And, and that relies on the on NATO members being united, which I'm not sure, given no, I, Germany's I, I, example at the moment, is, well, is I, a problem. Yeah, I, Ellie, I, I, Ellie Mayo Hagen. Sorry, two years, two years of yes, two years of pandemic, and I'm still on mute when I, my name is called. <laughs> um, well, to answer the original question, I hope not. Uh, I hope that we don't go to war with Russia. I hope that um, what happens now, you know, I do agree with the other panelists that this is a crisis that we're seeing at the moment in Ukraine. And what I think um, should happen now is de-escalation, both de-escalation of tensions between Russia and Ukraine, but also of the uh, differences of opinion and the divisions within Ukraine itself. I think that was the absolutely most important thing to do at this point, because, you know, Alex mentioned earlier that there's um, so many challenges that are facing people of this country and around the world at the moment in terms of the cost of living, in terms of tackling climate change, in terms of the pandemic. And what we can't afford to do on top of that is an armed conflict. It would be an absolute catastrophe, a total waste of resources, of times, of, of, of time, and of life. And so, I think that must be avoidable at all. It, it, it just mustn't happen. And I think all energy now needs to go into de-escalation of tensions. Dan Poulter. Um, so just just briefly, so I, 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 we are all uh, in in broad agreement on on this. Will there be um, war involving this country? Uh, almost certainly not, because as David said we, you know, Ukraine is not part of NATO, um, and we don't therefore have a, an obligation to defend the Ukraine. Do I? Do, does it look that likely that um, Russia will invade? Well, I think that does increasingly look to be the case. So the focus um, may well now need to be on, uh, you know, continuing to try and de-escalate, as Eddie May said, and. Uh, um, and uh, you know, evaluating the situation uh, if Russia does take um, the that, that ultimate step. Okay, thank you all for that, and thank you to Rebecca in Reading for the question. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. If you'd like to phone in a question to our panel, it's eight forty six. Cross question with Ian Dale on LBC. 10 to 9 on LBC. Dr. Dan Poulter, Sir David Liddington, Ellie Mayo Hagen, and Alex Thomas with us answering your questions. Um, Julian Suffolk has got a good point in response to something you just said there, Dan. Uh, Dan Poulter says, We have no obligation to Ukraine, yet in 1994 we signed the Budapest Memorandum. Ukraine gave up its huge nuclear arsenal, and in return, uh, Russia, the US, and the UK guaranteed Ukraine its sovereignty and security. Um, th that is a fair point, isn't it? Um, I, I think there is. I think there's some validity to that, but I think at the same time, I mean, we were dealing with a very different, a very different era. Because as I recall, and I, I was obviously very young at, at that time, but I believe that was um, part of um, the general ending of the Cold War. But also, the, as a as a part of that um, diplomatic um, engagement at that time, um, and part of the process of ending the Cold War and the breakup of the USSR, because, of course, um, Ukraine would have been very much strongly linked with Russia at that point in time. We also, I believe, around the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, agreed that NATO would not continue to um, expand uh, further east. And, I, and, and from that respect, that's one of Russia's, I think, largest concerns in this dispute. Now, we can um, 
look at matters as they are now, or we can look at matters through that historical okay. prism. Um, but, um, but certainly, I think um, uh, the context of um, the point that was raised by, made by Judith and Suffolk was in the context of the USSR um, beginning to break up um, and the uh, uh, end of the Cold War. Um, now, so I, you see it in that broader context rather than uh, in isolation. I'm going to issue you all with a challenge now to keep your answers quite short and then we can fit in two more questions before the end of the hour. Uh, Lenny is in Ashford. Hello, Lenny. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Um, with the Conservative that's just uh, crossed over to Labour, do you believe that the voters have been cheated? You mean the Tory voters in his constituency or just voters in well, general? Well, well of both of them, because, because the Tories have voted it for him as a Tory and the Labour voters might not have wanted him. OK, well, this is, of course, we're talking about Christian Wakeford, the MP for Bury South, who defected from the Conservatives to Labour last week. Um, Ellie May O'Hagan, let's come to you first. Well, I will keep it short because my answer is yes, I do believe that they've been cheated. I think that when an MP crosses the floor, there should be a by-election. And I don't think it matters um, which party they leave and then which party they go to. I think voters have the right to choose their MP and obviously which party they belong to is a huge part of that. So yes, there should have been a by-election and there should be, that should be a convention for whenever that happens. Alex Thomas from the Institute for Government. Um, uh, well, I suspect if there were a by-election, Labour would probably uh, win it anyway now. So, uh, uh, interestingly, it might be in Labour's interest to do it. Um, I'm going to both be short and disagree with uh, uh, Ellie May, which is I don't think there must be a by-election. I think um, MPs owe uh, uh, Parliament their judgment um, uh, and they owe voters their uh, judgment uh, as well. I think, uh, I think there are circumstances in which an MP might feel compelled to um, uh, to put themselves back for election, but I think uh, it's not a sort of constitutional uh, uh, necessity. Dan Poulter. Um, I agree with Alex. I don't think it is a, a constitutional necessity. And I also, you know, you, we have a, a, a democracy where we elect a member of parliament um, to represent a constituency and, and to use their judgment and exercise their judgment in doing so. And I can understand when sometimes a member might want them to put, put themselves up for um, uh, re-election in the form of a by-election, but there may be circumstances where that is uh, inappropriate. Um, so I don't think it should be uh, a mandated rule. That should be the case. So David, Douglas Carswell did it, didn't he, when he defected to UKIP in, what was it, 2014, 2015, can't remember exactly, uh, and he made a positive virtue over the fact that he was doing the right thing by his constituents, and they then uh, re-elected him, albeit for a short time. David, David Liddington. Yeah, I think I think um, I'm, I'm with Alex and Dan on this. I think that I mean, yes, the voters of, of Bury South have been shortchanged, but Alex is right. It's a tiny Conservative majority in 2019. Look at the opinion polls. The probability is Labour would hold that seat if there were a by-election. It actually can strengthen uh, the authority of uh, the defecting MP if they do submit themselves to a by-election and win it. Uh, but I, I I would not myself. Um, change the law to give political parties some constitutional status um, that an automatic uh, by-election would require. And it would raise all sorts of difficult questions. What if a party splits? And so you've got two parties as successors, each of which, which claims to be the authentic original party. What if the whips of any of the political parties uh, withdraw the whip from an MP? Uh, in practice, expel them. Do, do, does that then require a by-election because they're no longer representing the party uh, for which they were elected? So I think don't change the law um, and it's got to be a matter for the conscience of each MP. OK, Lenny, thank you for that. Admirably brief, all of you. Keep it up. Uh, Carla is in Docklands. Hello, Carla. Good evening, Ian, and good evening, panel. Um, my question today is, how do we avoid turning racism into a political football? And it follows on from the latest allegations of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party. We see that when Labour had their issues of anti-Semitism brought to the spotlight, they just got on the defensive, downplayed it, and just flat out denied the reality on the ground. Um, and their political enemies just used it as another attack line, and the victims in all this were ignored. And I'm afraid we're about to see the, real, the same thing happen um, in the Tory party. How do we avoid the very simplistic narrative that 
Tories have a problem with Islamophobia, Labour have an anti-Semitism, when it's an issue across all parties and we really need to figure out a meaningful way to take action and root it out from our political system. Well, Carl, you need to keep listening because we're going to be talking about this in a phone-in after nine as well. Dan Poulter. Um, well, I think that's difficult in a, in a political environment to, um, you know, to avoid the sort of inevitable political mudslinging that goes on. What I will say is, though, that um, it's absolutely right that if um, uh, there are allegations of this nature that have been raised by uh, Muscani, that they need to be uh, investigated and looked into because you know, none of us want to see um, decisions made in uh, political office um, that are um, uh, potentially um, influenced by any form of prejudice relating to uh, race. Uh, and uh, you know, I think the steps that have been taken to investigate it are the right ones. Um, is there an easy answer to say that we can stop the political mudslinging that results when cases like this arise? I don't think there is, I'm afraid. Okay, Alex. Oh, I mean, it's a great question, but it's a huge question. I mean, so uh, you could talk about it in the context of society, but I, I won't. I'll con contain myself just to this case. I think, obviously, they need to be investigated um, fully. Um, the extra point I would make is I don't think it should be on the individuals who may have been subject to this sort of treatment to pursue complaints, to put their lives, their careers uh, on hold. I think um, all political parties need to be um, better at um, creating conditions and processes uh, where they will look into these sort of either specific or general allegations without putting such a burden on individual um, MPs or others. David Ledington. First, um, where there is a complaint, it should be properly and fairly investigated. Second, um, there needs to be an acceptance that sometimes what has happened is not racism, but it is clumsy language or misunderstanding uh, of uh, the significance of words or even what different people have said. Uh, and, and, and third, stemming from that, don't you know leap to shout racist at people um, without good reason. I think there's been a bit much in politics sometimes of, of the, the, the shouting and categorization. Are, are you accusing like, Nazgani of that? No, no, certainly not. I and mean, one of the things that troubles me about this recent episode is that um, the, 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 I've worked with Nuss and I've worked with Mark Spencer, the, the chief whip, and I, I, I don't believe Nuss Ghani would have made the complaint she has unless she genuinely felt that the words used um, to her um, you know, were, were you know, deeply upsetting and harmful um, to her, belittling to her. Equally, having worked with the chief whip, you know, he's not somebody that I can imagine having deliberately set out to use words that had such an impact. So, I mean, I think the right thing is to, ha you know, to have a proper investigation of it. But I, I just sometimes think that you, you sometimes hear people chanting racist. Um, uh, the word is being used too loosely, sometimes about policies and policy positions people adopt rather than about language. But the, 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 the final thing I do want, the point I do want to make, um, Ian, is, is that every political party and every political leader at local level, constituency council or whatever, needs to make this part of their responsibility and actually bring things together. And I, I, I had a, a really ten, tension-filled you know, couple of days um, back in 2007. We had the 772 bombings, and it turned out that one of the bombers had come from my constituency. And I was really worried about the impact that this was might have on community relations I have a significant muslim population in my main town um but also the people were going to be very fearful and very angry about what had happened in london actually what we had was a rally in the market square and the mosque committee were there and the committee of the royal british legion were there and the civic leaders of all political parties and none were there as a physical demonstration that what brought us together as a community was okay. more important or powerful than right. anybody wanted to so to Ellie May. Gosh, I'll have to be quick. Um, I agree with the premise of the question, racism should never be a political, political football. And I think it's important to note that the Muslim uh, Labour network 
the Labour Muslim Network, sorry, did a survey of its members um, that found that Islamophobia was also a problem in the Labour Party. And I think that's evidence that actually uh, racism, whether it's anti-Semitism or uh, Islamophobia, uh, crosses, it, it's bigger than just political parties. And it's something that we should treat with uh, the solemnity and gravity that it deserves, rather than using it to sling mud at one another. Because the main group of people that that um, lets down are the people who experience racism. And I think it's disgraceful. So um, I will just leave it there and say, I think Carla was the caller's name, but I, I agree yeah. with Carla. What a nice way to end on. No time for our fun, final fun text this evening, but thank you very much indeed, all of you, for joining us. Dan Poulter, David Liddington, Ellie Mayo Hagen, and Alex Thomas. If you missed any of the show or want to catch up on previous episodes of Cross Question, you can do so on the Cross Question podcast on Global Player or wherever you get your podcast from, and of course on the LBC YouTube channel. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to be talking about Nuzgani's allegations against the chief whip of the uh, Conservative government, Mark Spencer. How do we, as Carla said, how do we avoid turning racism into a political football? And think about your own experiences. Have your allegations been taken seriously if you've made similar allegations to those that Nuzgani has made? 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's three minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom, it's understood two birthday celebrations were held for the Prime Minister during the first lockdown when indoor social mixing was banned. Downing Street says Boris...